Commonwealth's attorney, Ray Larson. Uh, Ray, we promised an update on the early release program, mm -hmm. catch and release, whatever you want to call it, uh, that the legislature has uh, enacted here in the state, which basically means people that were sentenced for everything from, mm -hmm. I don't know, a, a, I mean, it could be attempted murder because that's considered nonviolent in this state, according to our legislature. Uh, mostly burglars, though, people that break into your home and steal your stuff. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Let me tell you something. <laughs> They're letting everybody out early. They said this was going to be a nonviolent thing. Do you think robbery first degree is is uh, nonviolent? See, that's where you take a gun and you stick it in somebody's face and you say, "Give me your money, or I'll kill you." Mm -hmm. Right? Or, or the, and those are the dudes that like put those put pantyhose over their face, or the scary looking ones, and just jump from behind the car. Or, the or machine. a ski mask. I well, but have you seen? Worked a couple though. I had to chase a guy one night that actually had pantyhose over his face. That was a scary looking dude. I'm not going there. Yeah. Yeah. It was in the course of my duties. I mean, he just <laughs> robbed the place. All right. <laughs> anyway, but I'm just, I remember thinking, when I've got him handcuffed looking, I'm going, man, how terrifying would that be to have this dude, because this is what it show up at your car while you're going to the ATM to get you some money out at about midnight. And then suddenly this guy pops around with a gun with a pair of pantyhose on his face <laughs> and says, give me your money. Okay, and that, that's, these are the kind of people that they're letting out on this, on this program. And, and the thing is, these people, make their living committing these kind of crimes. So when you let them out, guess what? They're gonna go right back to it. Well, but, um, but this time, a lot of them have learned not to leave witnesses. So let me tell you, you what the deal is. The, the bottom line is, in, in Kentucky, first offenders almost never go to prison. Mm -hmm. They just, they're, they're probated and they're, and they're told to go to drug treatment and drug testing and that sort of thing. It's only after they've committed lots and lots and lots of crimes and they were repeat offenders do they go to prison, they're that 5% that commit most of the crime. Now, those are the ones that are in prison, the 5 percenters. And guess what happens? They finally decided, well, we're not keeping enough out, so we're going to let the ones that commit all the crimes out. We got this, I'm holding up this list, and Caroline Dunn, yeah, Caroline Dunn is the videotaping this thing. Is that what we call it? Mm -hmm. Is that eight track kind no, it's of not, talk? It's not VHS anymore. I'll explain it to you later. It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> but these are the people that have been released to Lexington. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, we're going to check these people out. And Dan Laren and our, I asked Dan if he would check it out. And guess what? We did. And there were 13 that were released to Fayette County just in the that the report I got for the last week out of hundreds. And here's what we got. Of the 13 people that were released back to Lexington, their total sentences were was 109 years. These 13 people got uh, 109 years. Now how much did they serve? How much time did they serve? Don't forget, these are the five percenters that saying, go to prison. 109 years was the total or the average. Is that the average of the total? That's the total. That's the total. Yeah. And so these people were sentenced to 109 years after being convicted by right. juries, going mm -hmm. through all the process. They've been convicted, jury listened to the case, and that's what they wound up with. How much did they serve? They served 65%, less than 65% of their sentences. It's, so there's no such thing as truth in sentencing. Now, what does that mean? That, and we went back and looked at their criminal records of these 13 people. And guess how many prior criminal convictions? These average? 13, no, these 13 people had total. There are 100 and, uh, I mean, there are 13 of them. These are the five percenters. They had... 166 criminal convictions. Now those are felonies and misdemeanors. That works out to 13 each. 13 before, before each actually, before, before, they actually before they went to prison. And these are the rascals that our legislatures decided need to be back on the streets because it costs too much to keep men. Okay, now that group in their history has almost two probation or parole violations each. That means they couldn't play by the rules even after they were sent to prison. And five of the 13 have already been rearrested. So I don't know what that percentage is, but it must be somewhere in the neighborhood of 40% have been rearrested. And uh, 
this during a time that they still should have been in prison. So, you know, this is what's going on. They're putting the price tag on the safety of our citizens, and I just we can only hope somebody can get killed well, by one of these. Th people. This is the the, uh, the story I was telling you about before we started the show. Uh, it says that the program began in January when 1,300 inmates were released initially, and right now state records show that as of March 1st, 160 of those inmates have already had the releases revoked. But listen to this. This is what makes me crazy about this. 160 of those inmates who were given this privilege, benefit, Santa Claus early release program, okay? More than 300 of them have violated the terms of the release. Now, when I do those numbers, if you've got 300 that have violated and only 160 are back in, they're giving them even more chances after they've let them out. Let them out. Can you, I mean, that is just shocking that they would do that. You would think that when they say, look, it's Christmas, you're getting out of jail, okay? Don't mess up. Well, guess what? They mess up and they still don't put them back in. So oh. that's the trick to this right here. You would think if you're going to let them out and you give them this chance that at least when they recommit that you just put them back in jail with no questions asked. It's they push it and push it and push it and push it. And push well, it. The, 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 here's what I want to know. I want to know what sort of uh, rules and regulations the probation parole officers, the people that are supposed to serve supervise these people. What kind of rules have they been given yeah. about? What's been handed down to them what's from been, the What have they been told not to do? Mm -hmm. And an example of that is we, we've seen correspondence before that was actually, I don't want to say leaked, but given to us by a probation officer where in his particular case he had burglars that he was supposed to be watching and he had some people who had committed their crimes at night, you know, that's why they were in prison, but they were specifically told to not visit them at night to see if they were home where they were supposed to be. In fact, as I recall, the way that they were doing it is you just have these folks come to you and check in, don't be going to their houses. And, and he was appalled because he's like, you know, I mean, as a probation officer, if these people are on probation and they're, the crimes that they commit are nighttime kind of crimes, you shouldn't tell me I can't go check on them at night because that's when they're probably going to recommit. I should be able to knock on the door and say, hey, is Jed home? Just want to make sure, Jed. Can I? And, and of course, probation officers also are supposed to have the uh, the, the authority to go in and, and search at random, based on what what the rules of engagement are there. And but they're not giving them the, the tools they need to, to do their jobs, and it's very frustrating for them. Oh yes, it's uh, it, well, it's more frustrating for the police who make the arrests. I see them get out immediately. They rearrest them. It's just it's very frustrating and. You know, uh, unfortunately, <coughs> excuse me. Sooner or later, uh, the public's going to get so fed up with it that they're going to just demand that something. Well, part happens. of the problem here is when I'm looking at this at this news story, uh, the the last sentence of the story says uh, the program was designed to save the state money. Most of these inmates are considered nonviolent offenders, so that's the thought that you're left with. And it's it really this is not the reporter's fault because that's what they're told. Now, if you dig a little deeper, let's define nonviolent, which we talked about that at the beginning of the show. If you consider attempted murder nonviolent, if you consider robbery first nonviolent, uh, though that's that's I guess that that's one thing. But when people think of nonviolent, honestly, what's the first thing they think of? They think of casual drug users. That's what most people think of when they think of nonviolent crimes. Uh, they, I don't even think that, that most people consider burglary a nonviolent crime. At least none of the victims don't. Tune in to the following stations every Sunday to hear full episodes of In Touch with Ray the DA and Don Evans.